Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We will get underway here in about 15 minutes as soon as Danny Merkley finishes filling out his speaker card. Hi, Dan. Don't worry, I wasn't picking on Danny. He's one of my favorite people in the whole world. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our board meeting Tuesday, April 17th. 2012, which you already knew. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, I will begin by introducing my two colleagues. Uh, to my left, uh, Vice Chair Francis Spivey Weber, and to my right, Board Member Tam Doduck. Uh, Mr. Howard, your folks, if you would introduce them, please. Thank you. Uh, to my right, uh, Chief Deputies Karen Turgovich and John Bishop. To my left, uh, Michael Lawfer, Chief Counsel, and uh, Janine Townsend, Assistant to the Board, is here is with us as well today. Thank you, Tom. As most of you know, we need to go through our emergency evacuation procedures. Uh, you'll note at the back of the room there are two emergency signs. If a unusual sound, horn, buzzer, something that doesn't sound right goes off, it needs you need to get the hell out of here. Um, we normally go across the street to the park, but they're renovating it. And if anyone knows where the J. Neely Johnson Park and Community Garden is, on 516th, 11th Street, if you would please inform the rest of the folks who evacuated the building because that's where you're supposed to go to. And I apologize about not knowing where it is, but I'm reminded to tell you to obey all traffic signals while you are going there. Um, so if you would do that, please. If you would uh, like to speak at this meeting today, please know it is being webcast and recorded. So when you come to the podium, please identify yourself and whom it is you're representing if it's someone other than yourself. Um, most importantly to me, if you would turn off all of those electronic umbilical cords that keep you informed with the outside world or put them on silent, it would save you from having a glare from me. Uh, with that, at every board meeting, we have an opportunity for a member of the public or members of the public uh, to address the board on items that are actions that are not pending before the board. Uh, we ask you to fill out a card to do that. Ms. Townsend, do you have any? Do we have anybody that has neglected to fill out a card that would like to speak in the public forum? Seeing none. Um, the board will consider the minutes from the March 20th, April 3rd, 2008 board meeting. So moved adoption. I was really the 2012. I wanted to see if Janine was oh. listening. <laughs> Thank you. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Do either of my colleagues have anything they would like to share with the world? Actually, I do. Pam? I just wanted to uh, share with my colleagues um, an informational item at the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board meeting last week. I think we've, uh, we've heard about uh, the issue of Hetch Hetchy and San Francisco water use in various newspaper articles the past uh, few months or so. At the regional board meeting, the San Francisco PUC uh, Stephen Ritchie, who was a former regional board executive officer who now works for the PUC, made a presentation on their plan on-site non-potable water use. And they are really pulling together, working within the city of San Francisco to put together guidelines, a framework, a local uh, structure, I guess, if you will, for a program uh, that would include recycled water, storm water capture and reuse. And they're projecting that by the year 2035, um, they are s they're hoping to have 60 projects, such projects online with a total potential of 100 million uh, gallon per year being recycled. I thought it was very impressive. They're just you know, getting started, but they're certainly you know, putting the pieces together, working internally within their various departments and agencies to make it happen. Since we are having uh, reports, I, I would like to comment to all of you, if you're not really aware of it, since we are down to three board members and I spend a goodly portion of my time here or on things pertaining to the water board, both Tam and Fran uh, are the board's representatives to every regional board in the state of California. And I think that's very important. Um, we really don't have any authority when it comes to addressing the regional boards and directing them in one way or another. Um, but it's very important to have a presence there. And I would like to take a moment to thank both my colleagues for uh, this extraordinary service. When there's five board members, 
you have one or two regional boards and it's not any big deal, but the two of them have been covering all nine regional boards and I would like to express my appreciation to them and all of you that are involved in regional board issues should appreciate that as well. So thank you. Um, we have uh, items three and four on our agenda are uncontested. Ms. Townsend, do you have any cards indicating anything to the contrary? I move adoption of the two items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Mr. Howard, would you please uh, present item number five? Item number five is a draft report assessing and aligning our priorities and resources. Uh, Karen Turgovich has worked with Eric and uh, Rafa on this issue, so she was going to introduce it. Good morning, members. Thank you. I'd just like to provide a um, brief background to this report. If you remember when you adopted the resolution pertaining to our fees last year in September, as a part of that resolution, you directed the staff to prepare a report that summarizes our resources, describes how we align those resources with priorities along with the prioritization tools that we use. You also directed that as a part of that process that we involve stakeholders um, to the extent possible as we carried out our analysis. In October, we came back to you with a draft work plan which you adopted, which broke the work into two phases. The first phase was really a look inward at how we, um, how our funds come into the organization, the programs that those funds are aligned with, how we develop our priorities, with respect to our programs internally, and then how we set our own internal targets. The second phase of that work plan was really to be a focus outward, where we would look at our regulatory programs and the cost of compliance to the regulated community, to our dischargers, and look at efficiencies related to those programs themselves. So this report is the first phase. It's our look inward. And so I just wanted to emphasize that because I know there's been an ex expectation of broad stakeholder involvement, especially as it comes to the four specific programmatic areas that you identified in our October item that you wanted us to focus on specifically. And because of the report's nature at this time, we couldn't find a very um, uh, easy and useful opportunity to involve stakeholders at this juncture. However, as we move forward into phase two, um, that aspect will be focused almost entirely within a stakeholder process. I'd also like to mention that the report itself provides um, some references to priority setting tools and several of those tools relate to the water quality monitoring that we do and what we find as a result of it and the use of the integrated report and what it says and means. And so we reported on the um, impairments and sources of impairments in the report. And the report was not at all intended um, to single out a specific industry, et cetera. It was more intended to identify how we can use these tools to identify our priority areas for focus. And then I also wanted to mention that we did receive several questions in the form of comments on the item prior to today, and the staff will be prepared to respond to those questions at the conclusion of their presentation. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Eric and Rafa. Morning, uh, Eric Oppenheimer uh, with me today. To my left is Rafael Maestu. We're with the Office of Research Planning and Performance. And I think uh, with that introduction, we can jump right into our presentation. Um, the purpose of this phase of the report was uh, really twofold. First, to describe the link between the fees that we collect and then how that money is spent. And secondly, uh, to evaluate and better align uh, our resources, priorities, and workload outputs. The report is uh, really uh, comprised of three main uh, sections. The first section looks at the sources and uses of revenues for all of the programs that are funded uh, by the Waste Discharge uh, Permit Fund. Uh, the second section uh, is a description of how we currently, as a board, go about setting priorities and some of the constraints that we encounter when we um, try to um, align priorities and expenditures. And then lastly, uh, we describe and introduce 
a new way to go about setting uh, performance targets that uh, basically uses a systematic approach uh, that ties our targets with our available resources. And we'll discuss each of these sections in a more detail through the presentation. Uh, throughout uh, the report and throughout the presentation, we talk about the WDPF programs, and I don't need to read them all here, but this is a list of the 13 programs that are either completely funded or partially funded um, uh, by waste discharge permit uh, fund fees. This uh, chart shows uh, the, the um, expenditures and the staffing levels for those 13 programs collectively over a 12-year period beginning in fiscal year 2000-2001. Uh, the top two lines that sort of trend together with each other uh, show expenditures. The uppermost line shows expenditures in real dollars that have been adjusted for inflation over time. And then the lower line, uh, that's sort of the brown color there, uh, is just uh, actual expenditures in nominal dollars. Uh, the other uh, line, the yellow line on the chart, corresponds to the access on the right side, and that just shows PY levels over time. The key message here is um, there's been a little bit of growth in terms of expenditures uh, over the 12-year period, not really much, especially when you look at it in real dollars adjusted for inflation. And there's been, uh, you know, fairly significant declines in staffing levels during that time. Next slide here uh, shows uh, essentially the composition of funding for these programs um, moving from uh, fiscal year 2000-2001 in the upper pie chart. And what we see there is that uh, back, in, back in that uh, time period, fees represented about 20% of the uh, funding resources for these 13 programs. Now looking at that same picture, uh, for the current fiscal year, uh, fees represent about 80% of uh, the uh, resources for these 13 programs. So when you, you know, when you put the two slides together that I just showed you, the message really is, uh, yes, fees have increased uh, fairly substantially over time, as you all know. Um, but these increases uh, are largely attributed to a shift from the general fund to a greater reliance on, um, on fees, not so much a result of uh, program growth or growth in expenditures. This uh, slide, uh, this slide, this slide shows the alignment or the, it essentially shows the alignment between the sources and uses of funding. It's, it's a butterfly chart. And on the left sh side of the chart, we have um, sources of funds. Uh, we, have, we have sources of funds uh, for each of the 13 programs. And then on the right side, we have the corresponding expenditures of those funds. So just looking at the left side for a moment, I wanted to point out a couple things. And I'm going to highlight here in red um, the, the, the dark blue portions of the of the um, bars that I just highlighted, that represents the sources of funds that are from fees. So those are the fees that we collected. Something to point out that this, this data is for fiscal year 10-11, so it was last year's data because we had full uh, accounting information for, for that year. We don't yet have it for 11-12, but um, in 11-12, there's going to be a lot more dark blue in this chart, specifically for the TMDL and basin planning programs that were formally funded with general funds, but moving forward are going to be funded with fees. Looking at the right side of the chart, we show the program expenditures broken out into three categories. In the first main category in that beige color that uh, Rafa's uh, hi just highlighted is, is the direct expenditures within each program. The turquoise part of the, bo of the bar is what we call operating and, equip operating and equipment expenses, and that also includes uh, many of our contracts that support our programs. And then the uh, last or th the next part in the brown is the indirect cost. So that's sort of the support cost to cover uh, administration, IT, things like paid time off, retirement, those types of things that are attributed back to each individual program. Then you'll notice for some of the fee-funded programs, actually for most of the fee-funded programs, 
There's a light blue port portion of the bar that I just highlighted in green. And that's the portion of the um, fees or fees that are collected from the program, but then are used to, p to pay for supporting um, functions that aren't directly um, relate that aren't directly in the program, but support the program. And those you, those expenditures um, go to things like enforcement, um, swamp monitoring, gamma uh, monitoring, and uh, those show that money actually shows up back on the left side of the chart, which I will now highlight in green. It's that um, blue cross hatching. Um, as a source of revenue for those programs. So it's essentially the portion of the fees collected that aren't spent directly in the program, but support the program. As uh, part of this, putting this uh, report together, we, we conducted a survey. Um, we surveyed state and regional board uh, supervisors and asked them for the last fiscal year um, what programs their staff worked on, uh, what percent of the time they spent their, they sp each of their staff spent working in each program. And the idea was to try to, try to do a, a rough analysis of how well our expenditures are, our actual expenditures of resources on the ground are compared to our budgeted, what we budget for. So the blue, the blue bars on the chart represent um, the budgeted amount of the expected expenditures. The units here are PYs, the number of people in each program, and the red bars are the survey results. Um, and in general, again, we found relatively good alignment between, between uh, the two data sets. A couple of uh, areas that we, you know, we did jump out a, a bit as possible areas where our our actual expenditures are exceeding uh, the revenues that support those expenditures were in the 401 water quality cert and in the irrigated uh, lands program where um, we show uh, you know almost I think roughly twice as much twice as many people working in the program than uh, we have budgeted support for. Uh, I do want to say that in the report we heavily caveat this graph and you know indicate that it you know it it is what it is. We did a questionnaire, we sent out a survey uh, during the course of collecting the information. There there was we it, 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 we uncovered some issues with definitional um, concerns where people thought they were working in one program and it was more of a question of how we defined programs. We corrected those to the extent we could, but there's still some, you know, some errors here, I'm, I'm certain. Um, also, we asked supervisors to go back and recall what their staff worked on. There's going to be some, you know, it's not going to be perfect, let's just say that. But it is an indication of, of where we stand. The, uh, the next section of the report uh, deals with how we as a board go about establishing uh, priorities. And what we found was, you know, in, in this is fairly common sense, but internally um, we set priorities in three ways. We have at, at the high level programs and we allocate resources to each program, NPDS, TMDL, basin planning, what have you. Uh, the more money we allocate to, the, to a program, the higher priority it may be, or we may focus resources on a program because it, it's a priority, but that's a way of setting priorities. Additionally, um, once, uh, once resources are allocated to each program, we can set priorities by determining what activities we do within the program. So for like the NPDS program, we can conduct inspections, we can issue permits, we can do enforcement, and we can allocate the resources based on what our priorities are. And then lastly, um, the state and regional boards themselves set priorities by establishing uh, priority projects that they, they have determined to be of high priority to, to the state. Uh, an example would be um, something like uh, the, uh, um, the frost protection rules that were uh, adopted, uh, I believe, last year. That was a priority project that you had identified. Uh, so, so those are the internal ways we set priorities, and then there's also legislative mandates, which in effect are external priority. You know, the legislature also sets our priorities. Um, an example of that might be the Delta flow uh, or the Delta um, legislation that went through a couple years ago where we were directed to establish recommendations for in-stream flow criteria, and it was a priority for us. We had a deadline, we had to do it, and we had to uh, commit significant resources to that effort. Eric, I have a question for you. When you're, when you're doing these allocations, um, 
clearly we are, you know, given your pie chart there in an era of fee-based revenue in many programs, but a lot of the programs that we deal with, whether they're legislatively directed or depending on the utility of the information we gather aren't necessarily directly attributable to the people that pay the fees. I think back as an example uh, that bothered me at the time and bothers me today when we did a Mercury TMDL for the Central Valley region uh, and we talked about test areas where private landowners were going to be asked to conduct studies um, on the methylization of mercury. In many respects, you know, the landowner might have some responsibility there, but in that particular program, a lot of the information that was being generated and a lot of the benefit was more to the good of the general public, if you will, as far as water quality and things that were beyond the scope, as I would say, out of responsibility of the individual landowners. Are we able to as we go forward and identify some of these areas that aren't directly attributable uh, to the fee payer portion of our economy, can we either go back and say, you know, this portion of our expenditures in this program are related to the regulated community and deals with the fees that they're paying. We need to separate off a portion of this and ask for general fund allocations or stop the program? I mean, how, how are we going to do that so that fee payers don't just get sucked into a bigger picture, I guess? I mean, that, that's a concern I have. I think it's a concern, you know, we as a board should have, quite frankly. We, if, I, if I articulated that clearly enough? Yeah, no, you, you did. Um, and we, we, we didn't do that as part, <coughs> excuse me, part of this report. Uh, I don't know that we have the information to do it right now um, from an accounting standpoint. Uh, that's something that, you know, we could do in a future phase. I would, you know, if you as a board directed us to, to, to go there, we could, we could look at that. But we haven't done it to date. I'm not sure we have the information. I'm not sure we don't. I just don't know if we could, we could parse things out to that level at this point. You and others have heard me say, you know, since we've gone down this path of, you know, the shift from general funds to, you know, fee payer based programs, it, it adds a greater amount of responsibility on our shoulders and certainly that's why I, I thoroughly embrace what you're doing here and commend Tam for her insistence and persistence, you know, on this issue. But, you know, we do have a greater responsibility to, you know, individual fee payers as far as accountability and what have you. And it would seem as we go forward that some of our programs, certainly not all, are going to need to be able to be bifurcated and will give the choice to the legislature um, or the governor's office if they want to allocate a portion of the funds for a program which we can identify as clearly to the benefit um, of the general public more so than the responsibility of the individual fee payers. And I, I realize that's easy to say and maybe hard to define, but I think it's something we should definitely be mindful of. Okay. And I think similarly to, to what Charlie just said, when I looked at the, the section that discusses allocating resources to program, I'm, I'm not clear if this allocation is done as a matter of factly carrying over things from previous years or, and I, I see Rafa nodding his head, or ideally what we should be doing is each year looking at what the priorities are, what the upcoming needs are, and then allocating the resources um, appropriately. From the way the report is written and from the way that uh, you presented this, I get the impression that what you're actually saying is that our priorities are established by how resources are allocated. And the way that resources are allocated may not necessarily have a direct linkage to the priorities themselves. And so that is an area that I want to make sure we highlight and explore a little bit further. I realize that it's, it's beyond the, the scope of what you were charged to do at this point, but if you are making notes, and I hope you are, about where we go from here, that certainly is an area I wish to explore. 
I, you know, uh, at, the, um, at the risk of piling on, um, one, thank you. This is, is, this is so enlightening to, uh, to all of us, and, uh, and I think to you as well. I mean, I think we have all learned from, from this exercise, and again, thank you, Tam. Um, I'm, I'm uh, interested in, uh, in also identifying where stakeholders are, uh, are carrying some of the program expenses, if you will, for the programs that we oversee. Now, we are responsible for paying for the folks on our staffs uh, at the regional level and state level who, who, who facilitate the work, but we don't always do all the work. A lot of the work is being done by, uh, by stakeholders. And I think that, um, that, that contribution, you know, uh, will significantly influence what the what the program really is trying to do to the public, and so uh, just it's on your tickler list uh, to to um, see how how we might capture that information. Again, it's not part of our budget. It's not, uh, but but sometimes we're going to have to allocate people to help with something that is largely going to be done by others who are putting that bigger portion of the bill. So it's, um, uh, it's just another piece of transparency that I think will be important. I, I would agree with Fran, but I, I will plant a thought, and, and that is that information I, I think is important, but, and I think I might be getting some into some dangerous legal waters here, but I think that kind of information would be information that I would look for in doing the economic analysis associated with proposed rules, regulations, and policies. And I know there's been a great deal of concerns about how we do that because there aren't any consistent guidelines or methodology, and I don't know how many economists we actually have on board, maybe one. Um, so, so if, you know, since we're making notes of things and tickling it, what Fran just suggests I think is a great idea, but let's, let's not rule out the possibility that that, that information could be used in a different forum than this one, which I think, which is you know focusing our internal operations. But I think at some point, uh, since I'm, I'm thinking ambitiously, we should discuss putting together economic guidelines. I mean, we you know economics is going to be has been and will continue to be a huge factor as we proceed. And while I'm not suggesting that you know one set of guidelines can can fit all situation. I have always felt that there should be some consistency in how we go about doing an economic analysis. This, uh, this next uh, slide here is a graphic uh, that shows, uh, it's, it's a graphic that displays our, what I would call our working budget. So uh, it's, our, it's our budget. Uh, with all of our pass-through money uh, removed. So all the money we spend on UST claims payments, grants, grants, bonds, loans, all that pass-through money has been taken out. And it shows, um, it shows the budget. Each box represents one of our major programs, and each box is uh, scaled to size to its relative uh, portion of the overall budget. So the bigger the box, the big bigger the budget for that program. And um, just uh, the total, we're looking at a roughly 233, 234 million dollars. Um, I'm just highlighting on the left side the piece of that that uh, supports the um, WDPF programs at 125 million. Not all of that money comes from fees, um, but currently about 100 million of it does come from fees. On the right side is the rest of um, our programs, and you know. Main message here is that you know now over half or roughly half our budget working budget is really derived from um, the WDPF programs or is, or is attributed to the WDPF programs and and a lot of that's attributed to fees. Um, if you were to look at our budget and you know make a determination of what our priorities are based on where we spend our money, uh, it's somewhat instructive. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight, just because it's so big, is this um, piece here, which I'll go back on it, but this is the UST uh, program expenditures, again, without the claims payment money um, that we pay out. Um, at $38 uh, million, it's uh, 
twice as big as the next biggest program, more than twice as big as the next biggest program that we have. Um, so, I mean, if you were to make a determination of what our priorities are based on where we'd spend money, you would come to the conclusion that, in this case, UST uh, program is a big priority for us. Not that it's not, but I just it's graphically instructive to look at look at the budget this way, and you can get a sense of what some of the, where some of the other programs you know fall out um, in terms of. Yeah, this is, this is one of my favorite charts, and and as Fran just pointed out, look at water rights. It really truly put it in proper context, and it does point out, I think, also areas where we need to have a discussion about. And I would definitely put water rights and the relative appearance of, of uh, lack of priority if you do it based on expenditure, that water rights is reflected here. So um, as it was pointed out in the introduction uh, to the presentation, we have a number of tools and methods for setting priorities. Uh, tools are, you know, our 303D list and our swamp and uh, gamma monitoring data provide us with information on you know where our biggest water quality concerns might be. We also have methods for setting priority including board direction, the accomplishments report, the triennial review process helps us set priorities for basin planning, the 106 work plan establishes commitments for the TMDL program, the NPDES wastewater program, the stormwater program. Um, the main point here is that we have all these tools and methods for setting priorities, but they tend to be, um, especially the methods tend to be program specific. And we, you know, currently don't have an overarching uh, method to sort of set priorities across programs. And we have the strategic plan. It doesn't really go into the level of detail um, that we're talking about here. So we, you know, we, pro we probably could enhance um, the way we set priorities and try to integrate some of these uh, tools and methods to do things more on a overall across program basis. And then um, this this slide really speaks to uh, board member uh, Dodok's earlier comments about you know the, cons the the you know how we go about setting priorities. We allocate resources to programs, but there are a number of program there are a number of constraints that don't you know necessarily give us freedom to fully decide how and um, where we spend our money. Um, some of those constraints are, you know, we're working in an environment of uh, declining resources, less staff over time. Um, some of the programs that we currently have are underfunded and, pr you know, setting priorities, there's less time available to do that, uh, less resources to spend on those functions. Ironically, it's probably the most important time to really do good priority setting uh, work because you have fewer resources to work with, so you want to make sure you spend your money in the most important places. Um, certain funds are earmarked uh, by the legislature or different earmarked for different reasons. The UST program that I showed you earlier on that graphic is a good example of that. It's based on a mill tax established by the legislature. We have to spend that money on UST, uh, on the UST program. We don't have discretion to spend it outside that program. Um, the, the degree to which we need to align our revenues with our expenditures now that we're fee funded um, is a potential constraint for us. And then uh, legislative priorities also become a constraint when we get uh, directives to do work uh, through, the, through legislative mandates and that work doesn't come with sufficient resources to do it, which is fairly typical in my experience. And we've got to redirect staff away from existing priorities to these new priorities that were established externally. So the end result of all these constraints is our, you know, our, our resource allocation mix um, doesn't necessarily reflect what our priorities or what where our most important water quality and water, water allocation concerns are. And this might be a question for Tom. On the last bullet there, when legislative priorities lead to a redirection, do we have a mechanism to make it very clear to the legislature, to the public, what the impacts of that redirection will be? In other words, what will we not be working on because of the redirection? Well, either through the policy setting committee or the budget committees, we generally have an opportunity to comment. Those would be the principal me me methods we would use to comment. 
but that sometimes goes on, you know, at committee hearings, and I don't know about you, but I don't always listen to committee hearings. I guess where I'm going with this is I, I would like to explore at the end of each, you know, legislative cycle when new legislative priorities or directions are given to the board that requires a redirection that we post on our website or we somehow make it very clear that because of these redirection, these are the things that are being impacted or these are the things that are lower priority, shall we say. Um, I think we do need to be very clear and transparent when these things happen. So I, I know that in the past we just sort of just swallowed it and, and did it and not really, you know, made very clear what the impacts would be. And then, you know, we get dinged for not doing everything we're supposed to do by the same legislature that causes the redirection in the first place. All right. I'd like to plagiarize that. I mean, I, I think what Tam, the point Tam just raised is critical for us, Tom, and I think it, it's I think it's a responsibility that we owe to the legislature because often things are thrown at us without necessarily considering what the impacts are going to be to other programs and what the resource allocation is going to be. I think of one such flow study that we did after 2009. It sounded all good and well, but it took a lot of time. And you know, I don't think we need to say that in a threatening way, but I, I think if we don't make that statement and make some of those impacts clear, we're not fulfilling necessarily our full responsibility to the legislature because just because they say you need to go do this, they need to be well aware of what the impacts are going to be to other programs. I, I couldn't agree with Tam more. So. And the same goes, obviously, when <coughs> your, for your board members direct uh, priorities to you. I mean, I, I think I've been hopefully fairly consistent to ask, well, what would that change do and how would that impact other programs? But I think it's just a good practice regardless of you know where the request comes from, the legislature, your board member, Cal EPA, stakeholders, whatever. I, like I assume this uh, report, it took away from something. So it would, be, it would have been good for us to know that. So the, uh, the last section of the report, um, we describe and introduce a, um, a systematic approach for uh, setting performance targets that's based on uh, resources and uh, will allow us to align priorities in our performance targets. Um, for four pro the, the goal was um, to develop this, uh, this method for four programs. They're listed here. Um, for the first three, we're well on our way. Um, for the Irrigated Lands Program, um, we um, not as far along as we had hoped. On that program, essentially what we found with irrigated lands, we did quite a bit of work with the roundtables and the, the folks in the regions that are involved with implementing the program, but it's a relatively new, new, um, new uh, program. We currently don't have targets where for the other three programs we had targets to start with. Um, and each, in each region where we've got an irrigated lands program, they're in different stages of, you know, of development. Um, like I said, it's a new program. We just didn't feel like we were at the point yet where we had enough information to, to move forward with a systematic approach that was, that was meaningful. Um, but um, we haven't forgotten about it. We're going to continue to work on the with the Irrigated Lands staff. Um, and like I said, for the other three, we've made a lot of, uh, a lot of progress. Uh, the overall uh, approach to the, to the method is to use a set of or develop, we developed a set of uniform uh, cost factors um, such that um, outputs or targets would be based on the allocation of resources or the amount of resources available for each program in each region. As you know, we've been establishing performance targets on an annual basis for the last three years. But we've been doing that on a region by region, division by division um, basis, and each organization has uses their own assumptions on how long it takes to do things, and um, uh, uses their own mechanisms um, to set priorities. Um, and because we were doing it on a in in that way, it was difficult to compare results um, from region to region across the state. So by using these common assumptions, these standardized cost factors, um, it will allow us to be able to compare results across the state and it will allow targets to essentially flow from the amount of resources available. Very simply, if you've got 100 hours um, slotted to do inspections and each inspection costs 10 hours, 
the target should be 10 inspections. That's you know kind of the kind of the idea uh, in a very simplified manner. We also wanted to recognize, and we did account for and recognize that we needed to have flexibility so that each region and each state board division could establish priorities um, and set their targets based on their priorities, and also recognize that you know the world's not as simple as putting everything into boxes and uh, and using a set. You know there are going to be tasks that don't fit the cost factor. You're going to have permits that. Are going to take longer, more time, or potentially less time than the than the average number, and the method that we developed allows for that, but it also requires that uh, we document when that happens and account for that, so we know why um, we did less permits or less inspections. This uh, this is a schematic that just shows the overall target setting approach. You start, um, like we talked about, by allocating resources to programs based on, uh, based on uh, what, what you need, based on your priorities. Um, once the resources are allocated to a program, you would th we then define uh, the activities that make up each one of the three programs, and resources can then be distributed to each activity. When you apply the target, uh, when you apply the standardized cost factors, you can generate targets. Now you notice in the in the um, in the figure, the arrows point up and down, and that's because um, essentially um, you can go from the top down, like I described. But but you know more commonly, it's it's both. You you distribute resources to activities, but you also might start out by setting targets based on other commitments. For example, if you've got a 106 work plan commitment to do uh, 50 permit updates, you're going you're gonna to start with your target, figure out how much it costs and how many resources you have left to do other activities. So it's an iterative up and down approach. And there's opportunities along the way to set, to set uh, priorities. Uh, just a word on the cost factors, the way we came up with them, um, because the method is very sensitive to what the cost factors are, we spent quite a bit of time with the roundtables, which are staff experts at the state board and the regional boards. And they, you know, we started out basically with professional judgment, but we had a couple data points from which to validate that professional judgment. Um, one was the 2000 needs assessment, um, where we had done a, went through a similar exercise and developed cost factors for various activities. Additionally, uh, the U.S. EPA uh, provided us with um, some information on how much, it, how much their time their contractors spend on similar activities uh, for uh, the NPDES program in terms of uh, developing permits and conducting inspections. And then um, just one note in the blue box there is that um, we, we, we definitely view what we've got for the cost factors as a starting point. They'll need to be revised. And then the last, uh, the last slide here is just a, it's a just a, it's a screen capture from a tool that we've developed and now deployed for the three programs um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail a, about it the main message was that we're now we, we sent this out to the assistant executive officers we we're going to be working with state board division chiefs um, and we've now developed a tool that e that basically enables the targets to be set using these methods so what you see here is um, for region four the amount of PYs they have to implement the program is 5.2, and they would use this tool to go through and uh, select how many they're going to do, how many targets they're going to do, or activities they're going to do in each group. And essentially, the idea is you get to choose what you want to work on, you know, based on your priorities, whether it's permitting or inspections. But in the end, using the cost factors, what you do and what your targets, the, the, the PY value of your target should equal the PYs that you have allocated to the program. So just, just a small piece of the tool that we sent out, but I just basically wanted to impress upon you that we're actually moving forward and implementing um, this new target setting method for the targets that will develop for fiscal year 12-13, which will be published um, before the beginning of the fiscal year. In terms of uh, some potential next steps uh, move forward with finalizing the phase one report based on your input and based on the input we receive. Um, I think a logical extension is to extend this target setting method to some additional programs. Uh, move forward with engaging stakeholders uh, to help identify some potential opportunities to uh, increase efficiencies and reduce uh, 
compliance costs and um, you know we, we you've already given us some additional um, input as to where we should go moving forward but we're certainly interested in in any other input uh, that you have uh, the last thing I wanted to do that concludes the presentation but we did receive uh, three comment letters um, the first was from the California uh, Farm Bureau Federation and uh, Actually, for all three, I should start by saying they all, you know, on a positive note, expressed appreciation to the board for undertaking this uh, report and directing us to to develop it. So everybody was, you know, very appreciative of that effort. Um, for the California Farm Bureau, in terms of consideration or concerns, uh, they were concerned that there was um, some information in the report that could misrepresent the um, agricultural community's activities and efforts. Um, and they believe that uh, the report should be clarified um, as to what the intent was and that it was an inward facing report along the lines of um, uh, Ms. Turkovich's introductory uh, re remarks. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's certainly something that we could do. And we can also work with the Farm Bureau to make sure we understand what their concerns were with the report content. Uh, we weren't, you know, intending on, you know, evaluating what you know, the sector specific uh, ac activities or actions that were going on. It was truly um, supposed to be more of an inward focused um, report. Um, the second set of comments came from the California Association of Sanitation Agencies and TriTech. Uh, uh, they were concerned about the short comment period, and indeed it was a very short comment period. Um, the report was only published with, I think, two, two to three days uh, notice to provide comments. They'd like additional time to provide comments. Uh, they believe the next step should look at opportunities for greater cost savings and efficiencies and incorporate stakeholder input. And uh, they also um, were concerned, they expressed a concern that the use of fees should be strictly tied to the programs from which those fees come from. Um, so I think, you know, for each of these comments, um, uh, in terms of additional time to provide comments, I, I think I'd leave that up to you to decide where you want to go there. And I think some of it depends on next steps. Um, incorporating stakeholder input and looking at opportunities for greater cost savings is one of the things that we put up on the screen. And um, the issue of fees should be tied to sources of those fees, I think, is, is more of a comment that, you know, we'll keep in mind moving forward. Um, the last set of comments came from the California Stormwater Quality Association. They were more specific toward the financial budget and revenue information in the report. I'm going to let Rafa just briefly goes, goes through, go through their three questions. Yeah, hi, good morning. Uh, Casco raised three issues. Uh, he basically said, uh, they, they asked that why the information provided at the stakeholder meetings is different from what we are presenting in the report. And um, basically what we are presenting in the report is not the revenues from the stormwater programs, is basically what it was expanding in the stormwater programs that was paid with fees. Uh, that answers question number one and number three, because basically we are reporting that we spend all the money now in the stormwater uh, program is, is paid with, uh, with fees. Uh, the second question that they ask is that why, uh, uh, we're, why are we inconsistent with the data presented in the report? And the reason why, and I need to apologize because we will clarify that in the, in the final report, is because some of the information is presented uh, in nominal dollars uh, and some of the information is presented in real dollars, basically adjusted for inflation. Uh, we believe that is more uh, significant to, to, to present information uh, adjusted for inflation for comparison purposes. Thank you very much. I'm not, <coughs> I'm not done with this item. <laughs> Actually, before you get to the comments, if I may, could you put up the next step slide again? Certainly. Um, with respect to your, your four bullet, well, three bullet item, the top three bullet item there, as far as finalizing the report, um, I would suggest we go ahead and finalize the report. It was intended to be staff summary, staff presentation of the internal understanding of how we do things and what staff is proposing. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable and would suggest that, uh, that we go ahead and do so. However, I appreciate the comments uh, that we receive regarding that, you know, folks that didn't have a lot of time to comment on what was in the report. So I would suggest that your second bullet, instead of expanding the target setting methods to additional program, 
that you take some time and work with the stakeholders, the CASA, TriTech, the Farm Bureau, CASQA, and others, and get comments and perhaps refine, I mean, continue your target you know, setting uh, procedures that you have in place, but get some comments from the stakeholders and perhaps refine both the priority setting as well as the target setting methodology and bring that back to the board sometime later on this year. Um, and then with the third bullet, definitely engage the stakeholders to identify opportunities. And I would suggest you pay particular attention um, to the indirect component. I noticed that in, I think, one of your charts, you had a chart, you know, where does, of the $100 in fee, where does it go? And I think $35 out of 100 goes to indirect costs. And there was little detail as to what those indirect costs are. And I'm not suggesting that they are inappropriate, but I would like further um, understanding of what those costs are and what opportunities there are in order to increase efficiencies and reduce that cost there so that it could be shifted more to direct costs in implementing the program possibly. Um, and so I think that, that would be my suggestions on where we go from here. I think you've done, both of you and, and all the staff who have been involved have done a tremendous job. Thank you. This way exceeded the expectations I had when I requested this item, and it's a credit to you, Rafa, and t to you, Eric, uh, and Karen, too, um, for your commitment in carrying this out. I believe this is a, a good first step, um, but I do believe that it's, it's critical to engage our stakeholders, who now pay 82% of our <coughs> resources, and get their thoughts, especially on priority setting, um, on target setting, and uh, again, on just increasing efficiencies and reducing cost before we expand it and further um, implement the, the procedures that you have outlined. And I, I would just add that I, I, I agree with the priorities that, that Tam has uh, put forward. But I think this is also something that, that really needs to be shared with the administration and with the uh, legislature because this, I think this is, a, is unique among Maybe it's not unique among state government agencies, but I suspect it is. And, um, and so I, I think we really need to let them know how we're looking at these uh, activities, particularly if we're going to um, th ask the legislature or even, uh, even the governor's office to support, you know, if, if they're going to ask us to do things, then we're, <laughs> we're, we're going to need to account for the, the, uh, the funding for those things. So. Uh, best we get in early before that situation uh, happens and let them know what we're doing. So that would be a, a, a request on this side of the aisle rather than on your side. Thank you. I, I will just follow up on one of Fran's comments and then we'll let you guys go. If this effort is unique amongst regulatory agencies, it should not be. Every regulatory agency should be following these same, you know, introspections, if you will, and analysis of themselves. So, you know, thank you very much. I know you both have, you know, taken this very seriously and, and committed a great deal of time to it, as you, well as you, Karen. I, you know, we've said it before, but this is very important, and I think it's part of our responsibility, not only to the legislature, but to the stakeholders as well. So, you know, thank you. With that, Mr. Merkley. Don't worry, I'm not going to say anything. Thank you, Chair Hoppen, members of the board. Danny Merkley with the California Farm Bureau. Um, I, I want to point out that, um, as was, was mentioned earlier, the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program is still a, a very young program, especially compared to some of the point source programs that, that the board has undertaken over the years. Uh, some of them taken 20 and 30 more years to develop, and non-point source, and particularly the the widespread uh, land mass of agriculture and diversity, makes it even more challenging. Uh, I will tell you, at first, when when I saw the report, um, I was very concerned, uh, and I I did call uh, Chief Chief Deputy Turkovich, and she calmed me down, got me off the the ceiling, um, and. Um, did you take a and picture of Danny on the ceiling first? Uh. At least I, I wasn't sitting in a uh, booster chair in somebody's office. 
Uh, you know, when it comes to fees, and this was mentioned a little bit earlier too, um, fees really are, and I tried to think of a different way to put it, but they're almost more insult uh, to injury than, than the, the real cost. The real cost of the program, as was mentioned earlier as well, um, is in compliance. And in the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program, um, we're not paying cents per acre, but, but we've been paying out uh, many, many dollars per acre uh, to implement the program on the farm and to help uh, the state and the regional boards um, see progress with, with this program. Um, efficiencies, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily fit a government structure, especially in a, in a uh, uh, democracy. Um, but we've seen some, some instances where the non-point source programs, particularly the Irrigated Lands Program, I'll hurry. Is that beeping at me to shut up? They were just taking your picture, Danny. Okay. Um, we've seen some experience or uh, some examples where the program has been much more efficient. Where, for example, the Colorado River Basin Regional Board um, had, I believe, it was about a 15-year plan to meet their sediment TMDL. Um, but through cooperation with agriculture and coordinating with agriculture, uh, particularly the Imperial County Farm Bureau um, taking the lead at getting growers to understand what needed to be done and, and to develop new management practices, found that uh, that program was very, very successful. Uh, they accomplished their goal, I think, in less than three years with uh, 98, 99 percent of growers participating. Um, we have some other examples of that, and then we have some, some sad examples, too. And, and it's difficult for staff, particularly in the regional board, that is not as familiar with agriculture as, as need be to understand how to, to impact these things, um, how to develop a program. And so I would encourage um, more participation, more coordination with agriculture um, to understand how we can more quickly, more effectively um, meet the goals that we want because uh, clean water is very important to agriculture as it is to everyone else. So, so we look forward to doing that. Um, I did mention tone and, and uh, context in the letter that we sent in. Um, really, it's more about um, setting the stage to understand, and I understand this is an internal document or, or an inward look, but understanding that much of what we're dealing with are legacy issues, legacy issues from implementing best management practices, the best available science and technologies at the time. We now know different. We'll know more next year and the year after that. And as technology and science progresses and we learn more, we'll be able to do more um, to, to address those kinds of issues. I'm a little concerned about how some of the folks I work with every day in the legislature are going to look at a report like this and take things out of context. So that makes it even more important that as they start to look at it, that they understand the context of this and, and what is being done uh, to address issues. I got a lot more to say, but I'll stop there and in closing just say that um, I, I look forward to hearing from staff and working, working with you and working with staff on the next steps on, on this. So thank you. Thank you, Danny. Terry Mitchell. Good morning, Chair, Board Members. Terry Mitchell with the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District. And today I'm here representing the California Association of Sanitation Agencies as well as TriTac. Um, I'll keep my comments somewhat brief. Um, I know staff had uh, indicated and highlighted some of the comments that we had submitted. Um, in general, um, I think I would like to express that we applaud the State Water Board for taking its interest and in moving forward on this effort to assess um, and aligning priorities and the resources with specific performance targets. And then I'd also identifying some of those opportunities for the future cost savings. Uh, we think this is a good first step. Um, and I think we're very encouraged with the comments uh, that we heard from you board members today um, as this process moves forward. 
Um, as we indicated in our comment letter, um, it was a short turnaround for comments, um, and I appreciate that this is an internal look in for um, where we go from here from, the, from an internal standpoint. Um, but we do appreciate the opportunity to work with staff and to refine the document as a, as a work in progress for that report. So um, we look forward to working with you on that as we digest some of the report and the numbers and the facts that are included in there. So um, I guess as we look forward, um, I was also pleased to hear that this is going to have a robust stakeholder process because that's going to be critical as we do move forward. The next phase is going to have some critical elements where we're looking at what efficiencies can be achieved and how are specific priorities going to be established that actually improve water quality. And with that comes the um, conundrum of how are you going to pay for that. Um, as we've seen in some of these charts, as, as the, the funding has changed, from general fund to fees, we need to align those fees, but we also need to ensure whatever priorities we're looking at do achieve water quality, and so different funding sources may need to be looked at. So there's a lot of work ahead as we move forward, and um, our TriTac and CASA is here to work with you and are looking forward to, a, like I said, a robust stakeholder process. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Question? <coughs> Chair, a question for Karen. <coughs> I know that the board um, set a, a time frame for completing phase one. I don't believe we set a time frame for completing phase two. And while I, I truly appreciate and support a robust stakeholder process, it's been my experience that uh, to be successful, there has to be some deadlines associated with such robust discussions. Comments, thoughts, Karen? As we um, presented in the work plan last October, we did not present a timeline, as you just said. Um, we did I in, intend to focus on the four programmatic areas and um, we wanted to be able to recommend that the MPDS wastewater component be one of the first areas that we approach <coughs> um, as an area where the stakeholder group has expressed a strong interest to work with us on identifying potential efficiencies associated with the cost of compliance. Um, I think that since we are currently in uh, April of the year, I think if we could focus just on the NPDES wastewater component um, w with approximately a three to four month time frame to be able to hold a series of initial stakeholder meetings, um, we could probably come back with to you with an interim report and let you know the approximate time frame to complete our recommendations. I would just hesitate not having engaged in with the stakeholders at all on this issue yet of specifying a time frame to come back with recommendations. How about we do this? How about you engage with all the stakeholders, not just the wastewater, and come back to the board, say, in two months with a, a report, a time frame for completing phase two? So it would be a work plan, essentially, exactly. for phase two. Certainly, we could do that. And when you say all stakeholder groups, we initially focused well, on the, the, the four, four areas. Yes. Okay. 